Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the first lecture in our fall 2021 series with Utah Valley University and the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, Utah chapter. My name is Paul Monson. I'm the president of the ICAA Utah chapter and also an architecture professor at Utah Valley University. And we are just so thrilled to welcome Steve Muzon uh, with us this evening, who will give us a lecture entitled uh, Architectural Moments, a new proposal for detailing traditional architecture. We'd like to thank uh, all of our sponsors. Uh, our work is only possible because of our, our sponsors and especially uh, for the generosity of FFKR Architects for sponsoring our chapter and this lecture series. If you would like to become a member of the ICAA and receive discounts to events uh, all over the, the country at, at uh, all of the chapters uh, around the country, you can go to uh, classassist.org online. Again, that's classassist.org and you can join as, as a member of the ICAA. Uh, this lecture qualifies for AIA continuing education credits. So if you need some of those, if you're an architect and you need your continuing education credits, you can send an email with your uh, AIA number to Alyssa Felix. She's our chapter coordinator, and we'll put her email address in, in the chat. If you have a question as Steve is giving his presentation, you have a question for Steve, uh, we'll take time at the end to do Q&A. Go ahead and type your question to the chat and then I'll moderate the Q&A session at the end. Steve Muzon is an architect, urbanist, author, blogger, and photographer from Miami. He founded the New Urban Guild, which helped foster the Katrina Cottages movement. The Guild hosts Project Smart Dwelling, which works to redefine a house to be much smaller and more sustainable. Steve founded and is a board member of the Guild Foundation. It hosts the Original Green Initiative. And Steve speaks regularly across the United States and abroad on sustainability issues. He blogs on the Original Green blog, useful stuff, and we do this because. And he also posts to the Original Green Twitter stream. We're so grateful to have you, Steve, with us this evening. Please give a warm welcome to Steve Muzon. Thank you so much. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and, and get into this. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, you heard a mention of a couple of things about the original green, and I'm not, I'm not here to sell books. Obviously, I can't do that if I'm not physically there anyway. But, but I did want to bring this up that uh, this book uh, came out uh, what 11 years ago now, and it was the culmination of of decades of trying to figure stuff out about how the workings of, of tradition actually happen. And, um, and there's, uh, uh, at the time, that was, that was uh, the best that I knew at the time, but I've been trying to figure out other stuff since then. What I'm presenting this evening is one of the newest things that, that I've uh, managed to put together that I think is a reasonable way of approaching things. But, uh, I write about it a lot uh, on originalreading.org, uh, and if any if anyone is on uh, Twitter and wants to tweetcast uh, this, then uh, uh, just the the hashtag original green, and I'm just uh, at Steve Mazan. So uh, enough of that. Um, but if if you had a question about it anytime during the presentation, every slide has these has those three pieces at the bottom. So um, so this there's five keys to this uh, to this new proposition. Um, one of them is that for years I had thought, I, I, I'd figured out years ago that architecture could be uh, arranged from the most, I used to call it the classical vernacular spectrum, but then I realized that every time I drew diagrams uh, about it, that I was always drawing the, uh, the, the vernacular on the left. And then, so if you read like, like we do left to right, then it's, it's now, I call it the vernacular to classical spectrum. Um, and it's been called a lot of other things over the years as well. Uh, Prince Charles likes to talk about the organic and the refined, for example. 
And so the organic being the vernacular, the refined being the classical. Um, I was speaking at a, well, actually teaching a class to a bunch of craft apprentices in New Orleans for the Princess Foundation several years ago. And when I was explaining this, one of the apprentices, he, he said, oh, I get it. You mean plain to fancy. So if you want to think about it plain to fancy as well, then that pretty much is, is uh, I mean, that, that, that's uh, one way of looking at it. Um, but then what I realized, and, I'll, and that's kind of the key to this whole thing, is that that doesn't really describe everything about uh, traditional architecture. There is a cross axis, axis actually, which goes from the reserved uh, to the romantic. And, and so that is, uh, uh, you know, and, and so that opened up a bunch of doors once I realized that. And then the, the matrix also uh, gives us a possibility. But it, the hope is that it would help us to, to, to begin uh, new living traditions uh, that, that, that start by the use of the matrix. And then there's some cost implications that I want to talk about. And then there's some uh, styles that are hidden in plain sight. We'll look at those. Uh, and then there's uh, six fundamental families of architectural elements that we'll look at and kind of go through it and, and show you how this works. So let's, let's get right in to the, uh, to the, the big epiphany uh, from way back. I say way back, it was, uh, I guess, about five years ago that, that I finally realized this. You know, that uh, the way I had arranged uh, the classical orders in, in the past was that the Tuscan was more vernacular uh, and then Roman Doric and, and Ionic and Corinthian and, and so forth. And, but then what I realized is that, wait a minute now, all four of those are equally classical. You can't say that, that uh, you know, that, that the Tuscan is, is really a vernacular expression. And, and so what I realized was that that the uh, Tuscan was just simply more restrained. And as you moved up uh, this chart on the right, what you're doing, they're all equally classical, but you're moving from uh, the restrained to the romantic, because obviously uh, the, the Corinthian is a far, far more romantic order uh, than is the Tuscan. And so, uh, and then what, when you go back to the left to the, uh, to the vernacular, the most vernacular is, uh, is just simply a post, uh, you know, supporting a beam. And then, then you move up and you have, you know, you chamfer the post and then you have a very simple uh, capital that may just be a two by two and so forth as it, as it moves uh, to the more classical. Now, the numbers that are on here, uh, if you see the little numbers on each diagram, like here where it says 15 to 30 and then zero to 40, what, what it represents, the, the vernacular to classical spectrum Actually, the way I've always described it is it runs from, from zero uh, to, uh, to 100. But in most uh, neighborhoods, and in the book that I originally uh, did that, this, that these are, uh, are pages out of was for a particular neighborhood where the, the, uh, the most vernacular uh, would, would not be below 15. Because once you get down to zero, that's just the simplest possible shed and nobody builds uh, the simplest possible shed to live in. And then it doesn't go above 75 either because, you know, you get up to uh, above that and, and then, you know, it might be like a state capitol building <clears throat> that, that also isn't going in your neighborhood. So it, it uh, so 15 to 75 is kind of the range uh, upon which this works. And then in the other direction, the zero to 40 is uh, from the restraint to the romantic. Now, the part that I didn't illustrate is that there's there's actually uh, the other half to the matrix that that you don't see here, and that goes from the restrained uh, to uh, to the the severe, or uh, and, and that would be like where it, it the most uh, the, the most vernacular end and the most uh, severe end would be like brutalism, for example, and then Art Deco would be just a little bit under the restraint, uh, but probably uh, 40 to 50 on, on uh, classical to vernacular, uh, vernacular to classical. See, I'm still making the same mistake after, uh, after figuring out those should be reversed after all this time. And so anyhow, but, but now that you get kind of the idea of what uh, the matrix is all about, uh, let's move on and, and uh, uh, take a look at, at what I'm talking about. Now, if you look at, now one thing I should note as well, uh, and I'm going to go back. The place for which I was, uh, for which I did this book, 
it's it's not really a pattern book it's more of an architectural toolkit i call it but you'll notice that there's a lot of empty uh spots in the matrix and for what they are building in that particular place uh these are all that they need to to get the architecture that uh that that they want to achieve and like for example here too you'll notice there's some blanks and it's for the same reason uh eventually i'm going to fill all of these in for that, that would cover a wider range of places but the idea is like say for example if you take uh this window right here which is uh, uh you know the number two spot both uh, uh vernacular classical and restrained romantic and but you see that it has the bar this bar on the right hand side that goes from five to 25. okay so there's the five end of the bar and here's the 25 end of the bar as you move to more uh, toward the more romantic and then here at the top you'll see that it goes from 20 to 40. so 20 is here and 40 is here and the thought is, is that what you do is you, you select a place, you select a setting uh, for some criteria that I'll show you here in a minute. And, and then anything, any of these bars that cross on that setting, you can use that. So the thought is that you, you, would, you, would, uh, you can cross pollinate with, you know, you can kind of open a door to the adjacent possible, they call it. In other words, there's things that would be uh, compatible, obviously, this window here has no compatibility with this window over here. Um, and so, but that, that's the hope is that you can actually, uh, through the use of the matrix, could actually uh, spawn a, a character of architecture that, that works well in a particular region that, um, that is not just a textbook historical style, but, but that, you know, because here's the thing, and this always bothered me as, as an author of pattern books. And, at a Congress for the New Urbanism one time, there was a there was a session on pattern books, and and having written a number myself, I was one of the speakers, and another one of the or, or panelists, whatever, and another one of the panelists was Ray Gendros, who did the uh, the uh, uh, celebration pattern book that really kind of kicked off the the modern day pattern books, and it was all based on historical style. And I asked Ray, I said, you know, <clears throat> I said if if anyone were to follow one of your pattern books uh, or one of my pattern books today or in 50 years, there would be no difference in the architecture that they would create because it is a very specific recipe of you just do this. And here's your five or six choices of, of, of uh, windows or columns or whatever the case may be. And, and so what always bothered me, and I told Ray, I said, you know, using pattern books as we know them, just based purely on historical styles, that has no power to let architecture live again. And anybody who has a copy of Bannister Fletcher's book can can see without uh, you know with, with no with, with great clarity that the uh, that, that that as you move uh, through time, architecture has always evolved uh, until we started having a series of little revolutions, uh, you know, beginning in the 1920s. And and so that's always been one of my things that that I've tried to. To get out is how can we actually let the architecture live again, take on a life of its own, and become something that we might not even anticipate today. And so, anyhow, but so so that's that's the basic idea of the living tradition part. Then uh, the cost thing is a really big thing because here is here is uh, here's I put kind of a gold star down here at uh, let's say that that somebody picks that point and and they well actually before I even do that. Uh, let's go over here to this diagram. And what happens, both as you move from the most uh, vernacular on, in the uh, left-hand corner, lower left, uh, to the more classical in the, uh, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, uh, the buildings get more expensive, the, the construction costs go up. But also as you go from the reserved to the romantic, uh, the, uh, the costs go up as well. And so if someone wants to get a uh, have a good target to shoot for is to where they want to be in the place that that I wrote this book for. They actually uh, were trying to do a uh, a more a more cost conscious version of another neighborhood that they'd done near, nearby called the Village of Providence, and and so they were looking for more of a kind of a working class neighborhood, and so uh, the the costs were a really big deal to them. So, but say understanding about where you want to be, let's say you put the gold star there, 
then then what happens is you see all the the horizontal green bars those those get you to uh to all of the things from vernacular to classical that you can use and the the vertical green bars uh they get you from uh, all of the things from uh, from reserved or restrained to romantic uh, that you can use. And, and so the green is, is the viable candidates for, uh, for elements that you can use. And then everything in red uh, is the stuff that you should not use because it would be kind of a, a Frankenstein monster of, of uh, ill-matched stuff. So there's an interesting thing as well. And, and that is when you, when you look at uh, styles on the matrix uh, that you actually can find uh, all the historical styles on the matrix. Now I'm pointing to to a particular point, but actually it would be kind of a, uh, a an area more like that rather than just one one precise point. Because you know, with the Talionate, there's a variety of expressions from vernacular to classical and for, uh, from reserve to uh, to romantic uh, or restrained romantic. And so so they're all still there, but the hope is it is is to be able to actually plant seeds that that uh, that actually uh, uh, move in directions that we actually have not seen before, so that so that in in fifty years that the same tool can uh, can end up producing uh, a range of results. Now, what I did, uh, I moved from Miami Beach uh, to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, about uh, well at the end, well, actually about three years ago, right now. And so, what I've done is I've, I've selected four buildings in very different styles, but but all traditional. Uh, and put them kind of where they belong on the matrix. Um, this obviously in the lower left-hand corner uh, is, is a, uh, just a simple vernacular cottage uh, by, by local standards. Above it, you'll find a bungalow. There's a good stock of bungalows uh, here. It, it's, still, uh, it's still vernacular, quite vernacular, but a bit more romantic than just the, the, the cottage. Um, and then on the, uh, on the right, you have kind of a, a, a restrained but highly classical building uh, on the uh, on the upper right corner. Uh, that is a more romantic. Now it would it would belong more like here on the. So this one uh, in the lower right corner is is very much uh, toward the right end of, of the classical building, whereas the the one on the upper left, I mean the upper right, it is uh, it's closer to the center. Uh, but it still kind of belongs in that upper right corner. Th that's the best representation I could find in Tuscaloosa of what belongs kind of in that quadrant at least. And, and so what you'll see as we go through here, that when I talk about these general rules of thumb of how, this, uh, how these things uh, should be used, that you, you'll see time and again how the basic rules actually apply to very different, these four very different styles in this particular place. And you could do the same exercise uh, in your town as well. And so that, uh, anyhow, just, just give that a thought for a moment, then I'll go on to the next one. And so <clears throat> in door and window surrounds, what we'll look at, uh, we'll look at first of all the doors and then the windows out of wood and then out of masonry uh, and then shutters. And then after that, we'll uh, look at the do and don't principles uh, of each of them. So. Uh, let's go ahead and get into that. So here is a, uh, the, the uh, front door surrounds, as you see in the lower left-hand corner, the simplest surround uh, is just a, uh, a flat jam casing and a, and a flat head casing with a, with a drip cap. And then as you move up to, uh, to get uh, more and more classical, then at the, uh, in the uh, lower right-hand corner is a, uh, is a Tuscan uh, surround, and then as you move on up uh, to the Roman Doric, uh, the Ionic, and the uh, and the Corinthian, and then you have some other uh, settings that would be useful in the particular neighborhood for which I'm designing this. Now, when you look at some general rules of thumb of of how door surround should work, um, on the left, now we don't quite do that bad anymore. Uh, th this was actually we were doing a lot of this stuff in the 60s and 70s, and and now it's gotten a little bit more refined, but several things you should never do. Um, obviously, uh, the the uh, the, pet, the broken pediment here is completely out of proportion uh, to the pilasters, which are really scrawny. Uh, there is no uh, freeze or architrave as there should be. Uh, and then of course the ill-composed door with single satellite in, in transom. Also another thing, you should never have, once 
once uh, the, the walled material uh, reaches the outside of the uh, of the blaster, you should never see it again until you get to the other side. You look on the right hand side, of course, you can see that the brick, once you get to the blaster here, then you see no more brick at all until you get to the uh, uh, to the other side. And so those are some things that that I think could be helpful with uh, with with the door surrounds on the on the frame opening heads. Um, this these are the the ones from again the very simple uh, head casing and, and uh, jam casing and then the drip cap uh, to where you move up to actually a, a much more refined version uh, in the lower right corner. Now, <clears throat> some general rules of thumb about this is that uh, on the left side you see a very common detail where where a um, where a window has uh, has brick mold on it and it looks totally scrawny. It, it's it's way too narrow because what should happen is the casing should be an allegory for both uh, both the uh, uh, the lintel, the structural lintel that's in the wall, and then also the pack studs or whatever the, the support is at the jam. Uh, and so these look like toothpicks picks by comparison. And an interesting thing, there's a lot of uh, architectural elements that by their name, they tell us how they should be used. So for example, in the case of a brick mold, uh, it should be used uh, uh, in uh, to case a window into a brick wall. You know, there, if the, if the brick wall is obviously supporting the load with whatever its masonry lintel is, then this has no need to be uh, thick. But if it's in a, a, a siding wall, then, then it definitely does. Uh, then let's look at, <clears throat> at some examples from this place. Uh, at the very most vernacular uh, is, is a uh, is a stucco wall that has no visible lintel at all because the assumption is uh, in a stucco wall that that there you know you assume a little that that's in there but you don't actually have to express it and then you move on up to just a square lintel uh, a jack arch and a jack arch with a uh, with a keystone uh, and finally up to a a more uh, classical entablature that actually sits proud of the wall uh, rather than just right at the wall surface or or sitting into it like the like the casings do here. Now, in the case of a masonry opening head, there are so many ways of getting it wrong. On the left hand side, you'll see this uh, uh, thick black line here under all four of these. What that is, that's the steel lintel without which these would all collapse. And because none of these are self-supporting, uh, however you uh, you do it, if, if you do it right. Now, even with a veneer wall, uh, it needs to have the appearance, you know, because it's not good enough that a building stands up. It needs to have the appearance of standing up as well, uh, you know, so it doesn't make people nervous when they go in the buildings. Like, is this thing, this thing going to fall on my head or what, you know? And so we don't want that. And so in this case, if if it's a brick jack arch, then of course all the joints converge down to a single point. Uh, you know, as opposed to simply like these that are just laid in because that creates uh, wedges that, that actually support the opening. Um, and then let's talk about shutters for a minute. Um, you know, again, this is another one of those uh, terms. Actually, you know what, I'll save that for the next slide. Let's just look at how they move. On the, uh, the uh, lower left is just a plain board shutter. That's the most vernacular. Uh, and then you have a framed uh, shutter with boards, in this case, that are diagonal, and then, of course, louvered shutters, uh, and then panel shutters. And then, in terms of the principles of shutters, what uh, what we're looking at here on the left are actually not shutters at all. This is, again, one of those uh, elements that, that the name of it tells you what it should do, you know, because a shutter is something that shuts. So, if it doesn't shut, if it just screws on the wall and does nothing, as you can see here from the, uh, the screw holes, it should be called by its proper name, which is a screw on do nothing. And when you ask your, your uh, clients or your customers, how many screw on do nothings do you want on your house? The answer should be zero. You know, <laughs> hopefully they'll realize that's a bad idea. Uh, on the right, you can see that, that this shutter, first of all, uh, unlike the one on the left, that's not even wide enough to close the opening. You know, uh, those are 14 inch shutters, which are the common, or 14 inch screw on do nothings, which is the most common size sole. Uh, and so they, um, 
you know, they, they can't even shut the entire opening that they, they miss in the middle. Here, of course, these shutters are half the width of the opening. And of course, they do have hinges and they do have the shutter dogs to hold them open uh, until you actually want them to be closed. Now, let's think about all of the things we just looked at and look at those uh, uh, those four houses in Tuscaloosa, and you'll see that all four of them follow all of those rules, even though the styles of each of them are, are very different. And so there's these underlying principles of how uh, traditional architecture should be put together that that uh, actually moves from traditional style to traditional style uh, very well. Uh, and now let's look at the, the columns and beams. And as we'll, and, and so we'll, uh, Again, look at the columns and the capitals, the bases, and, and chamfered post. And this is the uh, the diagram that uh, that you saw already. That it went, when I was talking about how the kind of the epiphany of the fact that it's not just a spectrum from one end to the other, but it's an actual matrix with uh, with two axes. And so we've talked about that, but but uh, just wanted to put everything in place. Now we'll zoom in, and uh, uh, you see here the capitals uh, of each of those. Uh, and then we have uh, the bases of, uh, of each that are used for this particular development. And then I'll talk about the chamfered post just real briefly. And that is that, you know, a chamfer, a lot of people think that's about style. It's actually not about style. What, it, what is primarily there for is about durability of the post. Because if, if you have a 90 degree corner of a piece of wood, I can take my fingernail and, and pick out some of the wood fibers out of the post just, just with a fingernail, you know, no tools at all. And, but if you have a 45 degree angle, because a chamfer is two 45 degree angles, you almost have to have a baseball bat to, much, to do much damage to that. And, and so it really is a durability move. Uh, and then the, it, it's just in the way that you terminate the chamfers at top and bottom that, that really has uh, something to do with the expression of the architecture uh, from most uh, vernacular to uh, most classical and also from uh, the most restrained, which tend to have, like these are all like 45 degree, uh, you know, wh whether the, uh, it is a, uh, whether it's just straight or, or uh, concave or convex. And then the more romantic it gets, the more elongated these tend to get. Uh, and, and so, or maybe even here, you actually have the, uh, uh, what basically is, is a uh, uh, summer recta. Uh, <clears throat> on the column and beam alignment, this is something that is, is one of the most common uh, errors that we have in traditional construction. Uh, either uh, on the, the very left here, this, this uh, entablature looks like it is thin enough and almost could split the column in two, uh, kind of like a wedge on, on, a, uh, on a, a block of wood. And then of course, this one looks so heavy that it might crush the column, uh, both of which are real problems. And then uh, here on the right-hand side, of course, the, the, uh, the architrave and also the frieze should always align with the face of column or face of pilaster. Uh, at the top, at, at the necking of the column. And, and you would think that would be so easy to get. In some places, they actually do get it. There's places that I work as town architect that, that actually, uh, you know, we've had good, good luck, a good success finally getting them to, uh, to get that right. But there's a, a lot of places that uh, just regular production builders that they still don't get that right. And, and so it's something we have to work on. Um, you know, these problems don't go away. Uh, in just a few months, it's, it can take sometimes decades. Then, excuse me, the intercolumniation problem is something that, you know, everybody's wanting to save money on columns. And so they, they skimp and they, uh, <clears throat> and you end up with, with a space between the columns greater than the height of the columns, which makes it look like they're incapable of carrying the load, or it makes the span look long. And there's a number of different ways uh, of proper intercolumniation, the, but at the, at the very least, from the center of column to the center of column uh, should be no greater than the height of the column. Not the space in between, uh, but the actual uh, center to center should be equal to or less than the height. And ideally, uh, it's a number of column diameter, diameters uh, that uh, if you get to that level of sophistication, you're doing, uh, you're doing better than most. Um, in terms of the column base alignment, uh, on the right is what you should do. Uh, and and uh, 
that the, the base of the column, the, the plinth of the column, should never come out beyond uh, the, the face of the pier below so that you get the, uh, it looks like you have a visible means of support. If you bring it out this far, in, in the case of the, the example on the left, what not to do, there, the face of the column is aligned with the, uh, the face of the skirt board below, but, but the base, which is what your eye wants to see get supported, is way out in front of the, uh, uh, of the, the pier, which is a real problem. On the uh, beam and soffit seam, this one is, is not just a, a visual thing, uh, it is a durability thing as well. On the left-hand side is the way a lot of people try to do it. But what happens is when you put uh, the beam soffit uh, on below the beam face, <clears throat> then that provides a little ledge there uh, for water to sit and to run back in and cause problems uh, inside the beam. What, what I like to do is what you see on the right, which is that the, uh, the soffit is, is uh, flush with the beam faces. Now, years ago when I would tell uh, trim carpenters to do that. They would say, Steve, I can't do that uh, because I can't keep them uh, totally aligned. Actually, I should be doing like this, totally aligned all the way down. Uh, and, and it'll make me look bad when they, you know, when they waver a little bit. I said, fine, no problem. I figured out a way that works. And that is that if you do a little three eighths inch rabbit on each side, then first of all, when they don't perfectly align, you can't tell it, you know, your eye doesn't pick that up because, it, you know, because of the shadow, uh, shadow line of the rabbit. Also, what it looks like is that the rabbit is a drip, uh, which is which is natural to put on the bottom of a beam. And, and so you don't, you, you really don't pick up uh, the fact that it's put together of, uh, uh, of, of some, you know, just thin materials with, uh, with blocking and so forth, holding it out there. Whereas this makes it very obvious that it, it's not a, a heavy timber beam, but that it's just a, you know, a bunch of one buys that didn't make it up. Now, I'll tell you what I've had a lot of good luck with in recent years. It took me years to get the first guy to do this uh, on one project. And then since then, you know, once the others see it, then they say, well, I can do that too. But basically what I, what I have them do is, is use a, uh, if the column is a six by six uh, or the post, then I have them use a six by six as the architrave. And then a one by eight sits right on top of that, that's, that's the tinea. And then a couple of number one, and of course this is all number one grade uh, treated. It's not, and of course in the, in the communities where I work, we actually can't afford uh, the really nice materials. But you, if you get a number one grade treated, then, then that, actually, uh, that, that actually is a pretty good uh, uh, piece of wood. But so the six by six, the one by eight, which is the tinea, and then the beam faces are a couple of two by twelves with blocking top and bottom, and and so to create all but the cornice of the entablature, uh, you know you have uh, one two uh, to get the architrave and tenia, three four to get the beam faces, and two pieces. So six pieces, as opposed to by the time you put these together, uh, with with uh, what what I'm not showing here is that is all the blocking and stuff. And you might end up with 12 or 14 pieces by the time you get it all done the other way. So it actually is very simple. Um, and and it, it, it's something I've had very good luck with in recent years, but it took forever to get them to, to start doing that. And of course, as you look at these Tuscaloosa images again, you'll see that all the principles we've just talked about are things that all of these four very different styles, uh, they do them in their own way, but they, but they accomplish these principles. And so, <clears throat> Now let's talk about eaves, and, and basically we'll look at some uh, open rafter tails and then closed eaves and then the do's and don't principles of, uh, of columns and beams. And so the, um, the, the, these are, you see there's nothing in the, in the most classical column because really once you get to the most classical, uh, it, those really should all be closed eaves. But you have some of these on the far right that can go on some pretty refined buildings you know, once you get into the 40 to 60 and 50 to 65 range, uh, that can go in some pretty refined stuff. In the lower left-hand column here, uh, that's just a square cut rafter, just like it comes off the stack. You don't have to do anything to it except cut the bird's mouth uh, and you're in business. And then the next one here at 20 to 40 uh, is, is a plum cut. So so you, uh, you have the bird's mouth and you have the plum cut and that's it. And then this... Uh, it, the next one up is a 30 to 50 uh, with a, a radius cut 
uh, out. So it, it's kind of like a cove, you might say. Uh, and then at 40 to 60 is a is basically a quarter round. Uh, and then at 50 to 65 is an OG. But you can see how each of these, as you move up to something that is more uh, more romantic, how they how they take the basic idea, like say the uh, just the square cut turns into a taper at this point, and then a taper with a uh, with a half round on it, and so forth. And and so each of these uh, moves up in that way. And then the there's less, uh, at least for the place that I did the book for, uh, th there's less options that they needed. Uh, but on the you know, in two basic types, uh, of course, are, are the more classical uh, cornice where you, where you uh, uh, where you actually have uh, a flat soffit with with a bed. Well, what, what it's a quarter round to begin with, and then turns into a, a bed and, and so forth as you move to the more classical. Um, and then there's the uh, th there's the slope soffits that are used with the more romantic uh, characters of architecture. That uh, here begins with just a a one by six and a one by two uh, at the uh, uh, at at the fascia and with the quarter round and then as, as it moves up, that becomes actually a frieze and an architrave and then you actually have a crown here and a bed mold there. So so you can kind of see the progression of those. And then here's how they each look when you uh, when you're looking at elevation as opposed to section. And then for the eve, so then we'll talk about the general principles on the eve return cap. What people have done in recent times is they try to, to, to learn to a degree how to do traditional architecture. They, they celebrate some things that they should not be celebrating. You know, on the right, what the Eve return cap should be is just a simple piece of flashing with no ribs or anything that basically disappears. You, you really don't see it much, um, you know, unless you're up on a, you know, a, a, a lift or something where you're right uh, on line with it, like looking at elevation. But what people do now They'll put these things up on a 12 and 12 or 14 and 12, make them out of copper, uh, hang them down all the way, uh, you know, hang them down further on, on the uh, on the fascia and, and put a lot of ribs in them to call your attention to something that should simply disappear. It, it really is a, uh, a, a lack of uh, uh, proper priorities. And now this is one, I should point this out. This is one of many mistakes that, that uh, when I wrote the original book, uh, Traditional Construction Patterns, that I used to think I was doing a good thing by doing this. I, I would put a crown down here where the bed mold should be, and I would also put a crown up there. And I said, well, you know, uh, crowns are, 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 you know, because it's so widely used, they're pretty cheap, and so that that looks good. Well, now, what should happen, I'm looking around to see, I don't have a baseball cap here where I'm at, but, but what, the way I illustrate it now, you know, a crown should really only happen at, at uh, two places in a building. Uh, that is, at either at the very top of the wall, it's a crowning shape, you know, or at the very top of a, a door or window surround or, or, or bay or some other element that, that uh, pops out of the building. And, and so what I'll do is I'll ask a builder, I said, can I borrow your hat? And then I'll tell him, I say, you know, putting a crown underneath uh, the cornice is like wearing your hat under your chin. You know, let's see if we can strap this thing around my neck and see how ridiculous that looks. And and when when they when they see it that way, then that's probably a mistake they'll never make again. And then of course we have our good old uh, uh, pork chop eve. A lot of people call them, uh, where you have the flat soffit and then it just turns up and breaks. And and I tell you something that happened to me recently. I. I I do uh, the town architect work in a number of new neighborhoods. I also do it in uh, uh, in uh, for a major university. And there was a building recently that uh, it's a big five story, uh, quite classical building that that uh, that's a new dormitory and mixed use building actually. And in and I was coming back home from I, I had to go out and, and take a look at something on. Uh, the other side of campus and was coming back home and just happened to look over there and they had the eve returns framed up just like pork chops and it's like what what's going on here you know uh after all these years of of uh you know trying to get this stuff right and we draw it right and then they get out there just i guess it's just muscle memory and of course they had to tear them out and do them right uh you know but i mean it's it just it, it's so much a part of the way that things are normally done that you still have to you know, uh, 
uh, 25 years after some of the first pattern books come out, uh, we still have to fight that fight. And of course, this, a normal, a, a proper Eve return actually accomplishes some of the same things. You see, this is a flat soffit as well, okay? But what it does, it returns on itself, uh, you know, so that the, the, the freeze comes back at least to the point uh, where the raking freeze uh, uh, intersects the, the Eve return. And then, of course, you have this profile on the inside is exactly the same as the profile on the outside, uh, with this, the exception of the summation, which only runs up the rake. And then uh, the freeze is something that very often gets left out. You know, I don't know if they, they're just cheaping out or what, but you should always have something uh, that makes the top of the wall, uh, you know, like, like a head on a human body. You know, you, you should not just have the thing, have the wall just slam up into the, uh, into, into the fascia uh, and call it a day. And, and so that, that's a real problem. And of course, again, back to the Tuscaloosa buildings, uh, as you'll see here, th these are, um, you know, you'll see the same rules being followed in these four very different styles when, when you're talking about uh, the eaves and, and, and cornices and so forth. And I've got just a few examples. So a very interesting thing happens uh, when you go inside, and that is when, when you go in uh, and look at the interiors and, uh, you know, whether it be bookcases or, or fireplaces and, and mantles uh, or, or elements that like a cornice in, in a house, um, really the elements and principles from, from the exterior really come to the interior. Uh, and, and so in a house that, that has, uh, or, or other building uh, that has uh, integrity, you might say, I don't want to sound too insulting here, but if it has an in, uh, integrity about it, then it tends to follow the same rules, both on, on inside and out. Uh, here's some mantles that are set up uh, approximately on the matrix. You'll see here that that is just almost exactly the same as some of the most simple, uh, some of the most uh, restrained and of vernacular uh, of, of the, uh, the the door opening surrounds. It just happens to be wider and, and have a fireplace in it as opposed to a door. And, and so, uh, but again, the, the same rules uh, on the spectrum. And here were, were two really beautiful examples uh, that I, I thought I'd show uh, just for fun. Then <clears throat> on dormers, we'll look at uh, the dormers uh, and the dormer sheet is actually very, uh, very, uh, uh, unoccupied right now because of the fact that these were the only dormers they needed at the place for which the book was done, as, as I mentioned before. Um, now, because of that, then this dormer here, for example, it has to go zero to 40 on the restraint to romantic uh, spectrum. Um, and so it, it, it has to do all of the job there. But, uh, but as I fill these out for other places over time, then, uh, th then you'll, you'll see more uh, more of a range there, but this is all they needed at the place that uh, that it was working. And so now let's talk about some of the do's and don'ts uh, of dormers. And on the jam material, between the uh, between the window sash uh, and the outside of the dormer, you should have nothing. You, you should have no siding whatsoever. Uh, and in particular, what you really ought to do is have just one. It for the for most. Uh, dormers until you get very romantic and you have uh, some some pretty fancy stuff going on. Um, what what you should have is a single board that is both corner board uh, and window casing. You see that that's just the one board that does both jobs. Um, and so in this particular case here, uh, like I say, that's one board. Let's count over here. So you have the corner board and you have the uh, window casing, and so that's two. And then the siding. Uh, pieces, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. If you count that piece at the, but well, let's just say, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, 13 pieces. Um, well, plus this, this one, you got a notch uh, up here. And so, which highlights a point that I made for a very long time. And that is that uh, when I'm doing these town architect things, I, a lot of the time I'm saying, look, there are calmer ways of doing this. We can eliminate some pieces, actually save you some money on the jams, so I can, then can get you to do uh, a nicer uh, a gable uh, or pediment um, up here. And, and so in most cases, the things that, between the things they need to calm down on and the things we'd ask them to do more on, 
uh, it normally ends up being pretty much a wash. So actually getting this stuff right, uh, it doesn't necessarily cost you uh, any money per se, uh, if, you, if you consider the things that you simplify on. Now, when we look at the roof trim, which is everything uh, from the top of the window sash on up, there should never be any siding in here either. Uh, and of course, this should all be designed properly according to this place in the vernacular uh, to classical spectrum. Even up here in the tympanum, that should be just a flat board, or if it's too big for a single flat board, it should be uh, just a flat faced uh, tongue and groove that, you know, so it's not a beaded board or, or a V groove. And then the adorn body proportions uh, to the roof proportion. This is something, now, when I drew these diagrams, there is some stuff out there that's so awful that it would be like shooting fish in a barrel. So I, I, I tried to, to diagram uh, dormers, well, all these building elements for, for people that were at least trying to do something right uh, and not the people who just didn't care. Uh, but these people were at least trying a bit. Uh, but what happens here from, from the top of the, uh, uh, the, the head casing to the bottom of the dormer, here is actually uh, a lesser dimension slightly than, than what, the, uh, what the width is. But the dormer should always be, uh, with the exception of there can be square dormers or there can be eyebrow dormers. So th th there's special exceptions that are more romantic than this, but except for those special exceptions, the dormer all, ought to always be notably taller than it is wide. And then if you wanna look at the dormer body to the roof proportion, uh, the, and again, this is not shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, there are uh, dormers out there. It's almost like, I don't know if y'all are old enough to remember the, 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 uh, the Dumbo books, uh, you know, Dumbo the elephant, you know, the huge ears that, that they look like that. But the, really the roof width should be no more than about uh, 25 to 45% larger than the body width. And in Tuscaloosa, of course, some of these styles don't have dormers, but the ones that do, you can see them. Even with these, uh, the, these uh, dormers that are, that are gang dormers for the, the arts and crafts stuff, uh, you see that the windows themselves uh, are still a vertical proportion uh, or square, uh, even though the dormer itself can be wide, as, as all the gang windows uh, or gang vents can be wide. And then attachments, just a couple of fun things here uh, in our last couple of minutes. Um, these, uh, here is a, a really interesting one that is fully filled out on the chimney shoulders. And the very most vernacular is simple natural stone. And then a uh, simple natural, you know, a simple brick. Now, as you notice, the shoulder height gets, uh, gets taller and taller. And then you also shift asymmetrically to one side. And then you do the same thing with, uh, uh, with the simple stucco and then uh, brick with the stone shoulders as opposed to uh, just brick shoulders. And then uh, stone uh, stepping shoulders. And then finally with the uh, the most uh, uh, the most refined of the uh, of the stucco chimneys that that actually uh, have that that actually make some uh, profile moves as well that, that are not just simple uh, just simple chimneys and and uh, uh, so and then here we have the um, uh, kind of the, the top of the chimney the caps of if when you took those same chimneys all the way up how would you finish them out now notice here that I've shown just the 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 uh, the actual flu cap because the fact we're dealing mostly with pe most people are not building in in places that I work or not building uh, uh, like an isochron or or a a, a full masonry uh, well I guess isochron is full masonry but but they have the uh, they have the the uh, uh, you know the the metal vents and so these all work with the metal terminations they they just kind of hide them from view where the, where they're not just uh, out there uh, front and center. And in terms of the, the uh, uh, chimney materials, it is absurd to clad something that is conducting uh, combustion uh, gases out of something that looks like wood. It's like, how quickly will this house burn down? You know, it ought, ought to always be some form of, of, uh, uh, of masonry that looks like it can stand the heat. And so, uh, and then of course the materials versus the detailing, uh, on the right-hand side, that's obviously a stone chimney and it's kind of a loose, uh, very vernacular top. On the left, it's stucco and you could be having special profiles, but it looks like you're just stuccoing a brick chimney. You can do better than that. That's not bad, but you can do better. And I am finishing right to the second on 750. I always pride myself if I can finish right on time. So uh, 
Uh, let's take the last 10 minutes for Q&A if anyone has uh, uh, any questions about what I presented. Well, thank you so much, Steve. That was like um, drinking from a fire hose. So much great information. I know we have some builders uh, on the on the uh, in the presentation that, that have been watching, and um, I, I wish every builder had a chance to watch your presentation. We we have recorded it and we'll, we'll uh, share it right. widely and uh, appreciate that uh, fantastic. Uh, presentation of, uh, you know, so like you said, there are ways that sometimes doing it right doesn't need to cost any more money. I think that's a, a great point that you made. So uh, if anybody has questions, go ahead and, and type them into the, uh, the chat and, uh, and, and I'll, uh, I'll moderate and, and ask Steve some questions. And uh, maybe I'll just start with uh, one of my own, I think might be helpful. I know we have a lot of uh, students, architecture students from UVU uh, on the call, and um, some of them are just beginning students sure. and prob probably really interested in um, what you talked about uh, being a town architect. And, and I wondered if you could explain just a little bit more about what that means uh, and how, you know, how you, um, how you work as, as a town architect, how you get a job like that, and what does your day-to-day -day kind of job description look like for, for doing that? Sure, well, uh, what a, uh, some town architects uh, do it uh, a different way where they actually get engaged in, in doing work in the place themselves. In my particular case, I draw a bright line uh, between uh, my work and, and working in the place because the problem is if you, it, you can be the most virtuous person on earth. I mean, as honest as the day is long and all this, but uh, there's always the underlying question, is he being as hard on himself as he is on me? You know, and, and so for that reason, I, I just simply, and in the beginning, I used to uh, do a lot of work in places where I was a town architect. And but I no longer do, and I, I never will again. It just it just muddies the water too much. Uh, you wanted to be able to th think you're absolutely unbiased in, uh, and you want to be absolutely unbiased in the in the reviews that you do. Now, for uh, for in the early years of of uh, in, in the town architect, the modern day town architect uh, position began uh, at Seaside, Florida, uh, at the very beginning where. Uh, where, where the guy that they had secretly decided would be the town architect, when they left in a, they were in a school bus after the shred, they tossed his, uh, uh, tossed his backpack out the window. When he went to retrieve uh, the backpack, they, uh, they were pulling away and they shouted, you are now the town architect, you know? And uh, so they, they left him there, you know, abandoned him. And so that, that was his, his job. But, and so, but in the early years, the basic proposition of the town architect's review is thou shalt do this because I have better taste than you. And while you might get compliance, you don't get, uh, you know, people are kind of grumpy about it. And so what I do uh, is, and I've developed this over the years, I've probably done more, more reviews than anybody alive today. I, several years ago, I counted it up. And I, at that time, I knew I'd done at least 10,000 individual reviews since the mid nineties, but uh, because of work in several places. But, but um, anyhow, the, the, <clears throat> mine is what I call it a principle-based review that I've, I've come around to that after trying every other method except one uh, in finding all their, all their faults. And basically what I'm saying is, it's just four simple words. And that is, we do this because. Uh, so if you put every pattern of architecture uh, into those terms, then somebody else might come up with something I never would have thought of. And, and that's great. And, and so that, that's where these living traditions can begin is if you have, uh, a strong base of principles that you, then you let ev everyone's allowed to think again, uh, not just me. Now, what I did for years and years is I would, uh, when I lived in South Beach, I would I would fly in once a month for a day or sometimes two and do all the reviews for that month, uh, sitting across the table from the builder uh, and the homeowner, if there was one yet, and also the designer or, or the architect. And so they all got not not just the what, but the why. And so a lot of the uh, architects and designers very quickly became a whole lot better 
you know, so it wasn't like they were bringing the same uh, mistakes time and time again, you know, because they learned because they knew why. And, and so that is a, that's a very powerful tool that without the why, you know, it, it just, uh, it, 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 you don't get as, as good a results as you do uh, with it being principle based. And, and so, uh, yeah, I've, I've, um, uh, it, and recently, since coming back to Alabama, I was, uh, uh, there's a couple of the projects where I'm town architect are actually here. And so I'm able to actually drive up and, and get feet on the ground some months and then other months they'll just send me stuff. And I've, I've got an app now called uh, Good Notes on my iPad where I can do, I can mark up a PDF just like I would mark up the drawing by hand uh, and send them back in. So, and that started during the pandemic of, of doing the remote review. So it can work both ways, actually. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I wondered also how your work had changed with the pandemic if you did more remote reviews. And, and so that's helpful too. They're good. We've got a question from Haley Packard. She said that uh, you mentioned you were going to add more to each of the individual matrix tables and uh, wondering if you're publishing those and uh, where we might be able to find them. Is, is this part of, uh, you know, kind of custom made for this particular development? Do you have a master matrix that, that you've worked yeah. on and just pull from or do you, do, is it, yeah, is it really just for this one place? Well, it's the, the book that exists right now is just for the one place and uh, the town founder there uh, paid, paid a, a, you know, a, a substantial fee to, for me to, to custom design the book for him. And so I don't, uh, I don't feel right about, uh, about just putting it out there uh, without having the conversation with him. Now, uh, now we'll say this, when I did my very first uh, style-based pattern book way back in, uh, I guess it was uh, 2002, um, and then I wanted to use the, that book as the basis for books in other places, and I asked him uh, for permission. He, he was very gracious about it and said, yes, of course, please go ahead. So I did, and I've got, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 books based on, uh, on that, uh, uh, on that one book. But um, I emailed him just the other day, and I haven't had a chance to actually speak to him about it. But I said, you know, what I'd like to do is use this book, uh, the Oakland Springs book, as a starting point. And, and uh, then I'll, at my own expense, I'll keep adding patterns to it. And so it'll become much more robust, but I'll credit Oakland Springs and you as being the, the you know, the person in the place whereby it started. And, but we just got to have the the face-to-face -face conversation and see where that goes. Now, the idea that the hope would be is that if he says yes, like he did before, that, that, um, uh, you know, as I add more material, then I would, I would post those as, uh, uh, you know, as we go along. And, and so that you kind of can see what's, uh, what's there. Eventually, once the book is mature and all filled out, I would love to actually publish it as a, you know, as a possibly even both a printed book and, a, and an e-book. Uh, but that there's a good bit of work left to, to make that happen. Okay, great. You know, at, at UVU, we do uh, try to root our curriculum in the classical tradition. You know, we have our students drawing the classical orders we have them designing, you know, based on precedent. And I always get the comment from students when they first learn these things that now they have these eyes that can't unsee all of the mistakes that they see around them. And you've opened our eyes to a lot more mistakes that now we're never going to be able to, to unsee. But I think that's a good thing to, be, to, to educate and to understand and, and we'll uh, hopefully continue to improve and, and take your ideas and, and apply them uh, here in Utah and wherever our students end up graduating and, and moving to. And I just wanna thank you uh, again for sharing your time and, and expertise with us. Um, if you are interested in learning more about what Steve does, it's the originalgreen.com, right? Or it's at .org, actually. .org. Originalgreen.org is, is the website where you can find, you know, more resources and links to his uh, blog posts and, and, and follow more about Steve. And so we, we wish you the best, Steve. And thank you so much for your time. And, and we'll sign off here and, and say goodnight to everybody. And our next uh, lecture is November 17th with the watercolor artist uh, David Schant.
And we're looking forward to that. And uh, uh, thank you again, Steve. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.